All right, let me invite you to turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, most of you know that Hebrews 11 is, or is, has been called, the Faith Hall of Fame, or the Heroes of the Faith. Faith is a very real and a very practical matter. Some will doubt and scoff at the whole idea of faith, but faith is everywhere. We see faith practiced in every aspect of human society. You know, you take your car to the mechanic, you have faith that he can fix it, or not, right? And you, you change mechanics. You go to a doctor, a re doctor is recommended. You have faith that he can take care of you. Our whole economy is based on faith. Cash has value which people put faith in. You know, when you go to the store, cha-ching, you put on a credit card by faith that one day you'll have the money to pay for it. But faith is very real and very practical. I want to talk to you about the way of faith this morning. You know, a man named John Maxwell tells a story about a small town in Maine that was proposed for the site of a great hydroelectric plant. Now, a dam would have to be built across the river, and the town that was in front of it would be submerged in water. When the project was announced, the people were given many months to arrange their affairs and relocate. During those months, a curious thing happened. All improvements ceased. No painting was done. No repairs were made on buildings, roads, or sidewalks. Day by day, the whole town got shabbier and shabbier. A long time before the waters came, the town looked uncared for and abandoned, even though the people had not yet moved away. And one citizen put it in this way. He said, where there is no faith in the future, there is no power in the present. That town was cursed with hopelessness because it had no future. The citizens of that town had no faith or no hope. The text we're going to read this morning speaks to, to the opposite of that, real faith. We'll see that those who walk in the way of faith will, number one, worship in truth. They will walk in holiness and they will witness to a lost world. In, it is the convic conviction of the scriptures is that faith is confidence. Faith is confidence in the trustworthiness of God. It is the conviction, the certain knowing that what God says is true and what he promises will be fulfilled. It will come to pass. We're also going to see in our text this morning that the best way to grow in faith is to walk with the faithful. And so let's begin that walk in Hebrews chapter 11, and we'll read to verse 6. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. For by it, that's faith, the elders obtained a good report. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith. Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it being dead yet speaketh. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God." But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must first believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So what is faith? We see in verse 1 and 2 a faith described or explained. We see the nature of faith. According to verse 1, it says that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Uh, that phrase, substance of things hoped for, the word substance means uh, assurance. Uh, the exact reproduction. It is that which gives real existence. That word here, substance, was used in ancient documents to refer to a title deed. Okay, Here's the title deed, 
And that is certain that you have ownership or possession of this land. It refers to the real thing, the real essence, the real contact, the reality of the situation. For instance, as a scientific term, this word substance is the opposite of theory. It's the opposite of hypothesis. Faith is reality. Faith is the fact, it's the assurance, it's the confidence of things hoped for. It's confident expectation. That's what it is. It's a real thing. It goes on to say not only is faith the substance, the fact, the confidence of things hoped for, but it is the evidence of things not seen. The word evidence there, it's a legal term. Okay, it's used in, 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 the, in, the, in the realm of law. It refers to that which would bring a conviction. Real evidence. It's a commitment. It is the inward conviction from God that what he promised he will perform. It's the evidence of things not seen. So if you can think about it in this way, the person of faith lives his life, lives his belief, with what his mind and his spirit are convinced is true. You know, again, as I've said, the whole economy is based on faith. The cash system, the credit card system, the way we, we, you know, we believe by faith, if we put in these hours, we'll, we'll receive this reward. By faith. So now, Faith is not a wish, it's not a fancy, it's a reality. Faith is a substance. It's the substance for the scientific mind. It's the evidence for a legal mind. It's real. It's a reality and it has practical results. Everything that we're going to speak about in regards to faith, faith is inherently speaking about the future. Right? Here's your paycheck. You have faith that when you take it to the bank, it's not like a rubber ball, right? You have faith that what's behind that piece of paper is what you earned. Faith is very real. Faith gives us the assurance of the other world, the unseen world, the world of the future, the world that does exist. It is very real, but you can't see it. The life of the believer today is, is in the assurance of another reality, a reality outside the realm of sight, the unseen. This is the way it described Abraham in regards to faith, these future unseen things. This, this person of faith is convinced of the reality of this unseen world and this unseen future. Genesis 15, 6 says this about Abraham, the father of the faith. It says, Abraham believed God. He had faith. He believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. It was credited, cha-ching, to Abraham's account because he believed God. Righteousness came from God through faith. So the, so the list that we'll come into reading here is a list of those who exercised this faith, and it had a very real impact on their walk of faith. So that's the nature of faith. It, it is, is that something that is real. It is the confident expectation that what God says is true and it will come to pass. That's the nature of faith. Now we're going to start reading about the heroes of the faith. These heroes listed for us, given for example and given for encouragement. We're going to look at the necessity of faith. Look at verse 2. For by it, that is by faith, the elders obtained a good report or a good witness or testimony from God. So by faith, people in the Old Testament were approved by God. They were accepted by God. These elders are the Old Testament saints that will, that will be listed here in this hall of faith. The Old Testament saints here exercised faith. They believed what God said. To depart from faith is to depart from what the Old Testament saints believed. 
There are some false teachings out there that said that the Old Testament was a system of works and the New Testament is a system of faith righteousness. That's not the case. This whole chapter is about those who had faith and their faith impacted the way they lived. So these elders here of verse two, these are the Old Testament saints that won the battle of faith through patient endurance. If you were to read Hebrews 6.12, Hebrews 6.12 says this, that you, that us believers of today, that you be not slothful, that is don't be sluggish, but rather be imitators, be followers of them who through faith and patience inherited the promise. So these are our examples. This is the necessity of faith. We have to exercise faith. And one of the things that we exercise in faith is to believe that God is the creator. We believe that God spoke. Look at verse 3. Verse 3 says, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. So we are able by faith to believe in the power of God. The word the, the word rhema, okay, the spoken word of God, is what is referred to there in verse 3. In other words, God said, God spoke, let there be light, and there was light. God created the heavens and the earth. How do we know that? We weren't there. God was. So by faith, we believe what God has said. By faith, the worlds were created, framed, completed by the word of God. Faith provides us with the fact of creation. He tells us how it happened. So we believe by faith, and when we believe by faith, we know God created. And you know the, you know the argument, behind every building there's a builder, behind every um, painting there's a painter. That's just common sense. And behind creation, there's a creator. And by faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. And he goes on to say, we're going to skip a couple of verses, and we're going to look at verse 6 here. By faith, it says, without faith, is it, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must first believe that he... I'm sorry, I, I keep on doing first... The word first isn't there, but it's implied, right? He that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So without faith in the confidence of, uh, in God, without faith or confidence in his truth, his word, his wisdom, and his power, we can't please him. This is practically true in human relationships as well. If you tell me something and I say, I don't believe you, what am I actually saying about you? You're a liar. If God says something, and you believe him, and you order your life and prioritize your life around him, you're saying, I believe who you are and your will for my life. If you say to somebody, if somebody says to you, you do this, do this, do this, and trust me, and you say, I don't believe you, that's an insult, and it's very displeasing. But if you believe, and you order your life, according to what God has said, that pleases him, as we see there. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder. So, here's a good definition. Faith is confidence in God that leads to obedience to God. If I have faith, then my life will reveal it through my behavior. True faith is based on what God says, and it's demonstrated by what we do, how we react. People with faith, they do things for God. And God does things for them. It says that he rewards them. And so what is it that he rewards them with? Well, that's the necessity of faith. We have to, we must have faith in order to please God. And as we please God, he says, I will reward you. The creator of heaven and earth will be behind you. 
Now let's look at those who will show us how they walked in the way of faith. Look at verse 4 as we, are, we ask the question, okay, if faith is all these things, who walked in faithfulness? Who were the faithful? Who are the examples of the faith? We'll see all throughout chapter 11 of Hebrews that uh, there is a listing. 16 people are named who had faith. Many others are referred to that had faith, but all of these are examples as well as encouragements. All of these weren't cookie cutter faith. Each one had a different mission. Each one had a different word of God that they would have to uh, you know, apply in their lives. And so we have the first one mentioned in verse 4. And it's interesting. As I studied this, you'll see the order of how these people lived and the order of their faith. How it's just, it is, it is beautiful. It is majestic how it is lined up. We see Abel here in verse 4. And his life is faith's worship or the worship of faith. What does that look like? Look at verse 4. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he, being dead, yet speaketh. So the first one listed is Abel. Abel is the second born of humanity. His older brother, Cain, it's believed that they were twins, Cain and Abel, but Cain was the older. So we see their story. If you have your outline, you can follow in the verses. But if you want to read it with me, here is Genesis chapter 4. What if these are the hall of faith, why is Abel mentioned first? And what did Abel do? Look at Genesis chapter 4, beginning in verse 2. We'll read the next four verses. But here is a little, little uh, biographical passage of Abel. Not a whole lot, but it is... A whole lot in terms of faith. Verse 2 of Genesis chapter 4 says, And she again bare his brother Abel. So she had Cain first, then Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep. That is, he was a rancher, farm, uh, um, a shepherd. Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. He was a farmer. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground and offering unto the Lord. Cain mentioned first because he's the older brother. Verse 4, And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto him, unto Abel and to his offerings. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. So here we see that Abel has been accepted by God. His worship, his approach to God was accepted. We know from Romans 10, 17 that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Okay, faith requires some type of word content, some type of information that you either believe or disbelieve. So we know that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so apparently, God had revealed to Adam and Eve and probably to Cain and Abel, the right way to worship him, the right way to approach him. And so we see here that Abel obeyed God by faith. So there's all types of debate on what was accepted and what wasn't accepted. I'll personally tell you that I believe that uh, because Abel, it was the content of the sacrifice. Okay, there was a blood sacrifice content offered by Abel. There was a a fruit, grains, content offered by Cain. Remember, Cain was a tiller of the ground. Remember the previous chapter? In chapter 3, God cursed the ground. Okay? And the fruit of the ground is, is eventually cursed. Later on, God would institute a, a, a grain offering, a fruit offering, but not at this time. And so we have... God instructing, this is how you approach and worship me. This is the acceptable way. It is true that you can, accept the tr you can worship the true God in the wrong way. That happens all over. And so let's see John the Apostle, the beloved Apostle's commentary on Cain and on Abel's sacrifice. Turn, if you will, or you can look in your notes, 1 John chapter 3, verse 11 and 12. In 1 John chapter 3, 
John speaks, the Apostle John, the beloved Apostle, says this, for this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Verse 12 of 1 John 3, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. So here is an acceptable worship presented by Abel, a blood sacrifice, a substitutionary sacrifice, something which I believe God instructed Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve, probably Cain and Abel, or God maybe himself instructed Cain and Abel. And how, would, how do we know it was accepted? Personally, I believe fire came down and burnt up the acceptable sacrifice. We see that with Elijah. We see that with Solomon. We see that with David. We see that with Gideon. We see that with many saints who offer up sacrifices. God accepted Abel's sacrifice, but not Cain's. And it says in our text that he obtained righteousness. He was accepted by God, and his worship was accepted by God. He did his worship and his work well. So we have Abel here as an example of someone who chooses God's way to worship him. Cain is an example of someone who thinks he can choose his own way to worship God. And essentially from the very beginning of scripture, we have two ways of worship. There are really only two ways of worshiping God. There's a faith-based righteousness, and there's a works-based righteousness. Abel, by faith, offered a blood sacrifice, substitutionary sacrifice. Cain offered his own idea in his own way. And that's the whole world. There's God's way of getting right with him, and then there's religion. There is only one way to get right with God, and that's through the shed blood of the Lamb of God. A faith-based, grace-based righteousness. Now Cain was a works-based. He tilled the ground. He cultivated it. He, 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 um, he, he reaped it, and then he offered, uh, offered it unto God. But that's not what God said, how you could worship me and approach me. And as John states, why did he kill his brother? He killed his brother because his works were evil. And Cain, or Abel, his brothers were, were righteous. So Abel chose the way of sacrifice and substitution. The blood sacrifice did not make Abel righteous. However, what made Abel righteous was his faith. And the evidence of his faith was this, that he offered the type of sacrifice that God determined, a blood sacrifice. His obedience cost him his life. And we see it says in 1 John, Cain was not a child of God. He was of the wicked one because he did not have faith. Or in other words, he was religious, but he wasn't right with God. Abel speaks from the dead. His life was complete. It was shorter than normal, he died young. But his faith pleased God, he believed God. Turn back in Hebrews chapter 11 or, or chapter 12 and I just wanna mention one thing about the faith of Abel. We'll move quickly here. In Hebrews 12, 24, it says this, comparing the blood of Abel, okay, and it's uncertain whether Chapter 12, verse 24 is speaking about the blood of Abel's sacrifice or Abel's very own blood that was, that was spilled into the ground. Now Hebrews 12, 24 says this, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. So the writer of Hebrews here is, is saying, look, let's, let's think about the blood of Abel and the blood of Jesus here. And again, again, if it's in regards to the blood sacrifice, if it's Abel's blood sacrifice this verse is talking about, then this is, what, this is what the writer is saying. The writer is saying, look, Abel's blood sacrifice was temporary and it was just a covering. 
and atonement. But the blood of Jesus Christ is once for all, never more to be repeated. This, the blood of Christ, speaks of better things. And the question that was asked in Hebrews 12, 24, is a reflection of what happened in Genesis 4, 10. The question was this, God speaking to Cain, what have you done? And it says this, the voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. So if it's Abel's very own blood crying from the ground, you know what it's saying? Justice. Justice. But the blood of Jesus says, forgiven. Forgiveness. The blood of Jesus is much better than that of Abel's. So Abel's worship was the example. He believed God, his word, and how to approach God. Now let's go to the next list on the faith, Hebrews 11, 5. 5, it says, by faith, Enoch was translated, that is, he was transferred or he was carried across. Hebrews 11, 5. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. So here is Enoch. If Abel's faith speaks about true worship, Enoch's faith talks about true walk. And that's how it begins. In order for me to be right with God, I have to approach him I have to be able to get together with God and have fellowship with him by substitutionary sacrifice. I have access to God only by the shed blood. And so after I worship him and accept the, the substitutionary sacrifice, which takes away my sin, that I am no longer separated by God. Sin has been removed, and there's been an at-one-ment, an atonement. And I'm right with God through worship the right way, Abel's worship. Now with Enoch's worship, the, the, the focus is on his walk. I'll read it to you quickly. Enoch's story is told in Genesis chapter 5, beginning in verse 19. It reads this way, and Jared lived after he begat Enoch 800 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Jared were 960 and two years and he died. By the way, that pattern, he died and he died and he, he died. That's the way of all the earth. Verse 20, or 21, And Enoch lived sixty and five years and begat Methuselah. So at the age of 65, Enoch has a child. And you know, this happens in life sometimes. You know, some men who are irresponsible at the beginning, they have a child and all of a sudden, they start growing up. But here, spiritually speaking, Verse 21, Enoch lived 60 and five years and begat Methuselah, and Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters, and all the days of Enoch were 360 and five years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. So Enoch is the picture of the walk of faith. Abel is the worship of faith. And just by practical experience, you and I can't go into the same direction. We, we can't go in the same direction unless we're agreed on the destination. Can two walk together unless they be agreed, the prophet Amos would say. Okay, you and I have to agree on the destination and the direction for us to be together. And so here we have a man who is walking by faith, who is walking with God for 300 years. And at some point in his life, God tells Enoch, he says, look, judgment is coming, and I'm going to take you. You will not see physical death. Some type of word content, some type of promise is given to Enoch that this would be the case, and Enoch walks with God for 300 years, and he is, he's snatched up. He's taken across. He's translated. He never experiences physical death. And you know, the Hebrew, Hebrew uh, scholars say this, prophecy is not only prediction of what's going to happen in the future, but prophecy is also pattern. The pattern here is this, those who walk with God in the church age will be taken up, snatched before the world judgment. Enoch will be snatched up, 
Methuselah's name is this. It means this. Judgment will come when he dies. And if you do the dates, Methuselah was the oldest man that lived according to the scripture. The year that he died was the year the flood came. If you read the commentary about Enoch in the New Testament, listen carefully. We know that Enoch walked with God, so he believed God. They were, they were on the same path, walking the same direction. And so he believed God. In fact, verse 6, without faith it's impossible to please God. That's a commentary on Enoch's life. Enoch believed God and they walked together and he sought for God's reward. If you were to read Jude chapter 1, there's only one chapter, verse 14 and 15. This is how Enoch lived. Listen carefully. For 300 years, this is what Enoch did. Jude, again, is Jesus' half-brother, and he gives a commentary on this man of faith. He says this, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So for three hundred years, Enoch is walking with God and telling people, Repent, judgment is coming, judgment is coming, judgment is coming. And when Methuselah dies, 969 years, judgment came and the flood. So here we have a man who walked by faith, who walked in holiness. His walk was a walk of faith. His walk was a walk of holiness. So we have the walk of worship and now the walk of holiness. Now let's look at the next example here in verse 7. In verse 7 of Hebrews chapter 11, as I close in the Bible's illustration, here is a man named Noah. You know the story of Noah, Genesis 6 through 9. The earth is so filled with violence, but Noah here, his, 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 uh, his, his theme, his motto is the witness of faith. God comes and tells him and says, look, I'm, go I'm gonna judge the earth with a flood. You start building an ark and it is believed, and I believe what, I think the scripture teaches this, that there had never been rain there had never been a flood. And so here's a man building a boat the size of a football field, taking a hundred years or more with eight people. He probably contracted out some work. But he's building an ark. And the people are looking at him. With every nail that goes into the ark, you know what it is? Tink, tink. Judgment is coming, judgment is coming, and the whole world, would you get a load of this guy? He's building a boat, and he says there's something called rain coming, and a flood is going to happen. So it caused a stir, no doubt, in the nation, in mockery, being made fun of, but for a hundred years, he is witnessing because he had faith God said, judgment is coming, build the ark. So Noah responded to God's word to build the ark. He walked with God, and with every nail in the ark, he witnessed for God. And in his witness, he rebuked the world. His righteous walk, his witness, condemned the whole world. Noah received righteousness from God, as we see there. He became the heir of righteousness Again, this is which is by faith. That's what Abel did, by faith. That's what Enoch did, by faith. And this is what Noah did, by faith. Noah's faith affected his whole being, his mind. He accepted the truth. His heart, he, he laid hold of it. His will, he obeyed. Do you see the order here? See the order of faith given by these three men? By faith, Abel worshipped rightly. By faith, Enoch walked in holiness. By faith, and you need to have those in that order. You can't, you can't get them out of order. Acceptance comes by true worship of God and the substitutionary sacrifice of a blood sacrifice, which is the, the blood of the Lamb of God. 
And then a right walk with God will validate your witness. If you don't walk with God and you're saying, believe God, believe God, it's like somebody saying, you shouldn't smoke, it'll kill you. Right? No one's going to believe that. Your worship affects your walk, and your walk affects your witness. Abel, Enoch, Noah. They had these four things in common as I close here. God spoke to them through his word. We have his word. That's number one. Number two, their inner being, their hearts, they were stirred. They had faith in God's word. And after the hearing of the word, the receiving of the word, they obeyed. Worship, walk, witness. That's the order. So let me ask you, if God were to write a new Hebrews chapter 11 part 2 and put your name there, by faith, so and so, worshiped, walked, and witnessed for me. Because God bore witness to them that they were people of faith. If I were to ask your neighbor, your family, your coworker, is this person a, a person of faith? If they said no, then something's wrong with your worship, your walk, and your witness. If they said yes, then your worship, your walk, and your witness are right with God. Are you in the way of faith? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you are real. We believe that you are, that you exist, and you reward those who diligently seek you. You rewarded Abel with a righteous testimony, the first true martyr of faith. You rewarded Enoch with fellowship, togetherness with you for his entire life, and heaven at the end. And you rewarded Noah with witness, winning his family to the faith. Help each one of us to walk in true worship, to walk in righteousness and holiness, and to witness to the fact that you are a righteous and a loving God. Help us to witness for you.